Our gospel text comes to us this morning from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Hear the word of the Lord. And as they went on their way, he, Jesus, entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the feet of the Lord and listened to all that he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. But there is need for only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and this shall not be taken from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I remember... I was in the second grade at Camden Frontier Elementary School in Camden, Michigan. And I was in Mrs. Moore's class. And I have a distinct memory of this time. I didn't have many friends in the second grade. Some of you may see that I still don't, but... <laughs> and I don't know if that's because I was a bit slow to catch on to things. I uh, didn't learn how to snap until after the eighth grade. I couldn't whistle until after my freshman year at university. So, it could have been that I just didn't catch on to how to make friends real quickly. But, I also grew up in a rather large family, not as large as the Kerasies, of course, but, um, <laughs> but I had an older sister and two younger brothers, and I realized that they were better friends than I would ever get at school. But I remember that I didn't have many friends, and in second grade, there was a kid named Travis. And Travis was the coolest kid in school, and everybody wanted to be friends with Travis. Travis's family had the money, and Travis always had all the coolest clothes that everybody wanted. He had the Nike backpack and the winter jacket with the Dallas Cowboys logo on it, which was a big deal in the mid-90s. He had the sneakers that everybody wanted, and I don't think we were still wearing the light-up ones in second grade, but whatever they were, I know we wanted them. Travis was the coolest kid in school. Travis, all the girls liked Travis. And I remember that Travis had a birthday in late March, and he had a reputation for throwing a great party. The year before, he took everybody to town, went roller skating, went to the arcade, went go-karting, he got some pizza, he went back to his house, he stayed up all night watching movies. He threw a good party. And to be invited in the second grade, to be invited to your friend's house, to be invited to the birthday party was a big deal. And so many of us spent our second grade year trying to be friends with tracks. We all jockeyed ourselves or tried to jockey ourselves into position to be friends with Travis. In the weeks leading up to his birthday, I would go home day after day from school and I'd jump off the school bus and I'd run to the mailbox and I would look through the mail, seeing if I had gotten an invitation. And day after day after day, I would hope and I would wait. And I would hope and I would wait for an invitation that never came. To be invited, to receive the invitation, is one of the greatest joys in this life. To be invited to the party, to be on the inn, is one of the greatest joys. To know that your friends care about you that they think about you, that they care to send an envelope through the mail with your name on it, is one of the greatest joys in this life. Yes, to be invited, to get the invitation. If you remember with me, three weeks ago, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, and we began a journey with Jesus as he would enter various villages on the way and encounter various people. We were there with Jesus as he was rejected by the village of Samaritans. 
We were there with Jesus when the man along the way said, I will follow you wherever you go. We were there with Jesus as the two other men thought that they had more important things to do. We were there with Jesus as he sent out the 70 who then returned with joy. We were there last week with Jesus as he was questioned by the lawyer and as he told the story of the Good Samaritan. And this morning we are again with Jesus as he enters yet another village. And here we meet a woman named Martha and her sister Mary. What's interesting about this cast of characters that we have come to know, or well, at least what I find interesting, is that they're people just like you and I. We've heard about the two men who didn't realize that following Jesus meant no turning back. We've heard the self-justifying of the lawyer. Today we hear of the irritation of the dutiful daughter Martha. And these cast of characters that make sorry, lame, and pitiful disciples are people just like you and I. There are people like us who think that following Jesus is just like joining another gym or it's just another membership at the country club. They're like people, or we are like them, who, who think that we can haughtily ask Jesus, well, just who is my neighbor? There are people like us who walk past the bruised, bloodied, and broken man on the roadside. They are people just like us who busy themselves in the other room, who scurry about behind the scenes, who keep their distance, who become angry that others aren't slaving away in their misery, who become angry that they don't sit in freedom at the feet of Jesus. Yes, these are people just like you and I, and we shouldn't try to deny it. When preachers preach the story, often we focus in on Martha and Mary, and we pit Martha against Mary. Martha is, of course, the bad Christian. She's the one who can't rest or relax. She's the one who's angry and irritable. She's the one that scurries behind the scenes, while Mary is the good Christian. She's the one that can relax at the feet of Jesus and hang on to his every word. I wonder if many of us this morning, if we were to admit it, would admit that we have a bit of disdain for Mary and a bit of sympathy for Martha. But I think that Martha has something important to teach us, and that's when Jesus shows up, we ought to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. But I don't think the main point is that Martha was wrong and Mary is right. You see, in the first place, Martha invites Jesus into her home. She extends hospitality to the Lord. And that's a good thing. But these witnesses of Mary and Martha force us to examine our lives. I don't think this story calls us to eschew hospitality, nor does it call us to the ascetic and contemplative life, leaving work for only those unchristian folks like Martha. No, I... But it does ask us a few questions. What is Martha's problem? Why has she not chosen the better part? Was it because she was too distracted to realize just who Jesus was? Too distracted to realize that Jesus had come into her home? Was Martha too preoccupied with her culturally predetermined role, for in first century Jewish society, when the guests showed up, the woman put on an elaborate meal. Could Martha not realize or imagine an existence outside of that which was demanded of her by society? Or I wonder, was it because Martha would rather busy herself and preoccupy herself with other, less important things? knowing that to go and sit at the feet of Jesus would mean that she would have to relinquish control. It would mean that she would have to enter into reality which she did not know. And she was more comfortable doing her duty in the kitchen. 
And I wonder if that is the way it is with us. How are we like Martha? In what ways do we fail to realize that God has come near, that Jesus is in the house? Are we preoccupied by cultural or social obligations and determinations and identities? Are we unable to see or imagine a reality in which we are called to freedom? Freedom to be something else in Jesus Christ that we are not able to be on our own. Are we like Martha, unwilling to submit to Jesus, unwilling to relinquish our false sense of control? But this text also asks us, how and when are we like Mary? How and when do we realize that Jesus has shown up? How and when do we submit ourselves at the feet of the Lord? How and when do we listen to the word of God? And the answer isn't Sunday morning, because an hour a week just doesn't cut it. And these are important questions. The story does force us, in the light of Mary and Martha, to examine our lives. But I don't think the story is ultimately about Mary, nor is it ultimately about Martha. This story, in the ultimate sense, is about the one who has entered the village. It's about the one who has come near. And when we focus in on the one who has come near, we can answer a more fundamental question. Why? Why should we not be like Mary, or Martha? And why should we be like Mary? Why? Because the one who has come near is Jesus. The one who has entered the village is Jesus. Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things in heaven and on earth were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. That's why, that's why we need to be like Mary and not like Martha, because Jesus is in the house. Because the one fully incarnate, fully God and fully human has shown up. The word made flesh is here. And that's why. That's why we need to be like Mary and not like Martha. I believe something. I believe something deep down in my bones, in the deepest depths of my soul. I believe something so much that I am willing to stake my life on it. I believe it so much that it makes me ache. I believe that God is still showing up. I believe that God in Jesus still enters the village. I believe that God in Jesus through the Holy Spirit is still coming near, is still coming to Oak Harbor and is knocking on our door asking us to let him in the home. I believe that God in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit is still calling us to listen, to submit ourselves at the feet of the Lord, to hang on to his every word. But I also know that for many of us, and myself included, we are not like Martha. Few of us recognize Jesus when he comes near. Few of us can claim to be Mary. Few of us submit ourselves at the feet of the Lord. Few of us hang on to his every word. I know that for many of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we keep our distance because it's easier. It's easier for things to be as they always were. It's easier to busy ourselves in the kitchen or in the garage, to treat Jesus as if he's just another guest. Now, Jesus doesn't chastise Martha. He doesn't rebuke her for not understanding 
or for failing to see. Instead, Jesus invites her. It's the invitation. It's the invitation that she's always so desperately needed. Jesus invites her to no longer be worried or distracted by the preparations of an elaborate meal. Jesus issues an invitation to Martha so that she no longer has to fulfill her cultural obligations or role. Jesus invites Martha into the wide open country of salvation where she is free to run and to dance, to play and to sing. He invites her into the wide open country of salvation where she is free to be who she is truly created to be. Free to submit herself to the Lord. Jesus invites her up into the high country where the air is thin and the grace is thick. Jesus invites Martha into a life of freedom. A life of freedom to be a disciple, to sit at the feet of the Lord and hang on to his every word. Jesus invites Martha to be like Mary, the one who has chosen the better part. For there is need for only one thing. Jesus invites Martha, the, 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 the distracted one, the preoccupied one, the one imprisoned by a reality that she can't get out of, the one who has kept her distance. And Jesus has invited her to come near, to sit at his feet, to be wholly devoted with him, to him with heart, soul, mind, and strength, to choose the better part. Martha had invited Jesus into her home. She was the hostess. He was her guest. But Jesus flips the script. It was Jesus who in the first place drew near. It was Jesus who in the first place entered the village. It was Jesus who first came to her. God is always the initial and primary agent and actor. And Martha's hospitality then is a response. It's in response. It's a response to Jesus coming near. And even when she misses that the script has been flipped, that Jesus is now the host and she is the guest, Jesus continues to invite her. Invite her to a life of freedom. Invite her into a new reality, the really real reality, where she is free to be a disciple, where she is free to enter a life shared with the triune God. And so it is with you and I. Jesus still draws near. God still comes to us in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. The triune God, is still issuing the invitation. And unlike my second grade experience, we don't need to be friends with the right people. We don't worry about who we need to know. Because the invitation has been issued once and for all upon the cross by Jesus Christ and is still going to the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, and west, this day by the power of the Holy Spirit. This invitation is being sent with your name on it, whether you are Mary or Martha, whether you are Stan or Paul, whether you are Sally or Pam, this invitation is being sent with your name on it. This invitation will change your life. It can, it should, and it will. It will call you to be something that you are unable to be otherwise, that you are unable to be on your own. This invitation will demand that we be redefined, that we are defined by the one thing, by Christ and Christ crucified. This invitation will call us, will call us to a life of freedom, freedom to submit ourselves to the word of God, to the word made flesh. And this invitation will give us eyes to see, eyes to see the one who has drawn near, the one who has come into the far country to bring us home. 
For when we can see the one who has come near, when we know who Jesus is, we know who we are. And when we know who we are, we know what we should do. When we know who Jesus is, we know who we are. And when we know who we are, we know what to do. And that's why we come here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We are gathered by the triune God to be reminded that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are gathered Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to be reminded who we are, children of God, sons and daughters of the one who died upon the cross. We come here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to be reminded who we are so that when we leave this place, when we go out to our homes and our places of work or our places of play, when we go into our various, enter into various conversations and relationships, we know who we are and we then know what to do. That's why we come here. That's what we do here. For when we know who Jesus is, we know who we are. And when we know who we are, we know what to do. Mary sat at the feet of the Lord and listened to all that he was saying. Mary has chosen the better part. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Daniel, Amber, Jennifer, Stephen, Kevin, you are worried and distracted by many things. But there is need for only one thing. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.